My beloved brothers and sisters and all friends and visitors, it is my great joy that to be with you this morning. Um, it is always wonderful when God's people come together, but particularly at such time when uh, representatives from many parts of the world gather together and we can testify of the great work of God throughout the world. Um, this morning I wish to share with you something that is uh, very dear to my heart and I'm sure very dear to every one of us. It is about Jesus. Brother Silva said, plan of salvation, yes, plan of salvation which, which Heavenly Father made together with Jesus. And this title, Where Were They? He Died Alone. Or where were we when he died? Um, we are told in Spirit of Prophecy that we should study the life of Christ. And particular which, which portion? The last. The, the last. Thank you, sister. The closing scenes <coughs> in particular. And how long each day at least, how long, a minimum we should spend? At least one hour. A day we should spend contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. That's in the Azar of Ages 83. Now, my brothers and sisters, I believe that all of us, and young people, every one of us should read the Word of God personally for ourselves to realize the, the price that was paid for us for me. And this is the very reason that we are here sitting in this very place, is because of Jesus. Because of the sweet sacrifice that was made on the cross of Calvary for us. Many people talk about Jesus. Multitude actually, multitudes of, throughout the world talk about Christ. And many people also follow Christ. But I would like to have a look and to share with you this morning the multitudes that followed him to the cross and multitudes that followed him when he was helping them. Now this is something that we have considered ourselves and I will not cover the whole portion from, from uh, Thursday night until resurrection, no. But I will just cover one portion where he was brought before Pilate. And I will read from all four Gospels, portions of the Gospels I will read. I just wish to tell you, I have told you that before probably many times. I, by the grace of the Lord, I had the opportunity to start reading the Word of God in my youth when I was about 16 or 17 years of age. And at that time, growing up in a communist country, as some of the brethren who are here sitting were also in the former communist countries, it was not easy as a young person to read the Word of God. And uh, at the age of 17, those who have heard already a few times, so you might be patient with me, I had to go to this pre-military service there were about 400 of us, 17-year-olds. And the military officer uh, gave us a big speech about military, how we should defend ourselves from the enemies. And then he started talking against Christianity, against those who read the Bible. And he challenged, he challenged us, 400 young men, those who read the Bible... Come forward. You heard me say that before here. Those who read the Bible come forward. But of course he described the Bible as one of the most terrible books to be read. Should never be read. The poor man, really. He didn't realize that Christ also died for him. <coughs> Christ suffered for him also. But And then uh, he uh, waited. He, he should challenge a few times. 
before three people decided to go. A 400 three went forward. And by the Lord's grace, I was one of the three who went, who went in front. And I said before, as I said before, I did not run forward. I went very slowly. But as people say, buying my time. And a friend of mine who was standing beside, next to me, he was saying, because he knew, I told him already what I believe, that I read the word of God. And he told me, don't go. Don't go. <laughs> what will they do to you? I feel sorry for you. I'm your friend. Don't go. I went. But when he asked me the question, what, why I read the Bible, I must, understand, I must admit that at that time I did not know many things from the Word of God. I did not understand many things. But I understood one thing. And I praise the Lord for that. And this very, the very words which I told him, I read the Bible because the Bible tells me about Jesus Christ, my Savior. And I told them real loud. And there was on a very high platform and very loud speakers. The whole 400, the whole valley was echoing. And he was so enraged. <laughs> The, the, the enemy of souls doesn't like that. He said to me, and now even louder, I'm going to see whether Jesus Christ, your Savior, can save you from my hands. Well, he did, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord is so wonderful, my brothers and sisters. <laughs> so let me start reading from the Word of God. And let us read together. If you have Bibles, open the Bibles. We shall read from Matthew chapter 27, 20 to 26. And I want to, uh, you put, uh, to pay particular uh, attention to the word multitudes. And who were they and where were they? Who were the multitudes? <coughs> Verse 20 says, and right down to 24, or rather 26. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. You know what Pilate, what uh, option they, Pilate gave them? You choose whom? <coughs> Barabbas or Jesus? Now the Bible says, And the governor answered and said to them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And what did they say? Barabbas. Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, let him be crucified. <coughs> and the governor said, why? Why do you want Jesus to be crucified? Why? What evil had he done? Did they answer to, did they answer to Pilate what evil he did, why he should be crucified? No. But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing. But that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, and saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Well, Pilate, being a Roman governor, he should have known better, don't you think? Because Rome had very just laws that innocent people could not be even, even punished, even beaten. They had to be set free, let alone being crucified. And he said he's innocent. He was not innocent. He tried to somehow appease his mind, his conscience. And so, then answered all the people... And he had said, He is blood on us and our, and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he had no right to do that either. He delivered him to be crucified. That's Matthew's record. Let's now read Mark. Very much the same. I like to read all four evangelists. Mark chapter 15 from verse 9 says, that, But Pilate answered them, saying, What we... Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? But this is not preaching, actually. This is a Bible study. I'm just reading the Bible from you because I think it is. I could not, in my own words, 
tell you so wonderfully the way the word of God says it. So explicit, so clear. But the chief priests, notice now we read in, in Matthew, the, priest, the chief priests and elders. Again here we read, the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. The chief priests and elders. So they were who were in today's terms? Elders, we still have elders. But chief priests? Ministers. Ministers. Of what church? Were there these Roman people? Were there Romans, these people? Were these chief priests and elders? Were there Romans? Who were they? Jewish? Who were they? The people of God. God's people. Who were they? God's people. They were Sabbath keepers. They were what? Seventh day Adventists. Were they? Seventh day Adventists in time of Christ. Because they kept the seventh day. Adventists are who? People who are awaiting Messiah to come. What were they uh, crying out? Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. We have to question ourselves, my brothers. Let's go further. It is so dramatic, so, so tragic in itself that people of God did that, not the Romans. What did the Roman governor to declare? He is innocent. What did he want to do with Jesus? Save him. Set him free. Let's go further. Let's see what, what Mark has to say. But the chief priest, yes, that they also said that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I should do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried again, Crucify him. Then a pilot said, why? Again he asked question, why? Why? What evil had he done? Was there an answer? No answer, my brothers and sisters. Just note every word. No answer. They simply say what? And they cried even what? Did they, did they tone down their voices? No, they yelled even. They screamed, they cried, they went wild actually. They cried more exceedingly, crucify him. <coughs> then Pilate released Barabbas. <coughs> Let's see what Luke has to say. Because all four evangelists had recorded this, this tragic story. 23, chapter 23, verse 18 starting. And they cried, how? And how did they cry? All? Once. At once they were so united, weren't they? <laughs> they were so united. You know, the word of God speaks to us about we should be united. We should be one, isn't it? We should be one in Christ. But here they were united to evil. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. And you read, then the Bible says who this man was. He was a murderer certain sedition he didn't sit in murder and Pilate what willing to release Jesus spake again to them but they cried crucify him crucify him again no answer and they were instant with loud voices if evil ever acted its part in its full strength it was then my sisters. through God's people this is something that we have to consider how far God's people can go how far down in rejecting Jesus and yet still professing to be God's people the priest said what in front of them the, 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 the plate they had the, the, the garments when they didn't they they ministered in the service they brought sacrifices they did all the rituals yet they told people their members when they came to church 
tell Pilate that Jesus should be crucified. But be united. You must not be divided. Because where is the strength? In unity is strength. So we have to be united to reject Jesus. Not only to reject him, but to crucify him, to put him to death. And we have to be united to choose Barabbas. Brothers and sisters. But we would say, no, we would never do that. I think Brother David this morning said that we were beyond this, but we are different, isn't it? The same song. But we are better. But don't say twice, my brothers and sisters. Let's, let's read. Let's further read. And so they were instant with loud voice requiring that he might be crucified. And so, and Pilate gave sentence that they should, that it should be as they required, tragically. And they, he released the murderer. And they cried, in verse 25, they cried all at once, saying, away with this man and release us, Barabbas. And finally, John chapter 19, Gospel of John chapter 19, verse starting from verse 15. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king, who is their king? Who is the king of the people of God? They chose Caesar. They chose Caesar. My brothers and sisters, this is a tragedy, history. So sad it is that when you read, you feel like crying within yourself and saying, why, Lord, why? Why did these people act like that? For many thousands of years, the Lord, for many years, the Lord strove with them. And for many years, the Lord taught them. He gave them the holy oracles, the commandments. He showed them their love. He did everything. He gave them the prophets. He gave them the teachers. He gave them the ministry. He gave them the temples. He gave them the leaders. He gave them every opportunity. He called them his people. And yeah, he made them his people. But they said, oh, the only king we have is Caesar. No other king. The multitude followed him. Now let's, and that was multitude that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Now let's go back before that now to his ministry. While Jesus worked. Now Matthew 20, 29. It says this way. I will go again to the, to the four Gospels. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Now, why did this multitude? This time, it was, it was before. It was, um, we are going back now. Okay, we are going back now uh, to look into his ministry. And Matthew 20, verse 30 says, and so on, to 34. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, and they, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. The two blind men asked for mercy. They asked Jesus to have mercy on him, on them. And verse 31 says, And the multitude rebuked them. Because they should hold their peace. But they cried more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, this, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will ye that I should do unto you? They said unto him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. How wonderful it is. Here is Jesus in his element, if you like, compassionate Christ. The multitudes say, keep quiet to the people who are blind, who want to see. But what did Jesus do? He stopped. He had compassion on those two blind people. And he heals them. Now let's go to, uh, to John. Um, Chapter 6, verse 2 says, And a great multitude followed him. A great multitude followed Christ. Because why did they follow Jesus, this great multitude? 
because they saw his miracles which he did on them which were diseased. Them that were sick. Christ heals the sick. He heals the sick. So spiritual maladies and, and physical. He is the physician. The supreme, the great physician. Now healing many. Let's go back to Matthew now, chapter 4. And verse 23 says, And Jesus went about the Gal all Galilee, teaching in their, in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness. Healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. My brothers and sisters, no human being ever was to do this, was able to do this. Never. Like when I told uh, these office, uh, police officers in China, love your enemy. No human being has spoken this but Jesus. No human being. We have doctors, we have what we call uh, health workers. And each health worker can do some good for humanity. They can help. That's true. When we were in Croatia, that's Brother David was there as well, uh, there was a health, uh, international health worker seminar of reform movement. And they did some wonderful talks. And uh, we could see that it's uh, had some wonderful results. But they could not do this, what he, Jesus did. What did he do? He healed all manner of disease among the people. <coughs> so he did a complete restoration of health. And of course, verse 24 says, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and healed them all. Christ healed everyone. Oh, how wonderful it would be, my brothers and sisters, isn't it? Did you ever have a desire when you went to a sick bed, a person being very sick? To think how wonderful it would be if I could tell this person, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. Did you ever get this desire? I must admit I did. People, especially those whom you really very, you love all brethren, but those who are very close to your heart, when they are sick and you feel helpless. And I know even a close friend of mine died in church. He was my friend since our youth. He died relatively young man. And I spent eight hours with him in eight hours while he was dying. At the end of eight hours he died. There is a big, great difference between life and death. While he was alive and I talked with him virtually all day, he was alive. His face was different. His body was different. And then when he got a final heart attack and the, the, the doctors came and took him away, and they didn't, I want to follow, but they wouldn't allow me. But about an hour later, they brought him back dead. A great difference, brothers and sisters. This man was still, the face was still there, but total difference. And I must admit, oh Lord, why? Why do you not give me power that I could say in the name of Jesus, my dear friend, arise? Because we do not have that power yet, but Jesus did that too also. Jesus healed them all and raised the dead. And they followed him and multitudes followed him. Matthew 8 verse 1 says, When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Matthew chapter 2, it says this way. And behold, there come a leper and worshipped him. Chapter 2, verse 2. And worshipped him, and Jesus healed him as well. Matthew 8, 16. And, when, and, and the even was come, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Oh, our Lord. So Mark says the same thing. Let me just read from Mark chapter 1. Um, when he healed, uh, you know whom healed there? Simon Peter's 
mother-in-law, he healed her. And he, and he came and took her hand by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto him. And so again it says here in verse 32, And that even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased. Again. As Jesus passed by, I read this uh, book. As Jesus passed by, not one person was left behind sick. Was, they were all healed. All healed. Everyone was well. And so they followed Jesus. They followed him. They felt the power of Christ in their body and in their spirit, in their lives. And of course, in Luke records also about the blind people, it says, Luke seven twenty two. Then Jesus answered, I said unto them, Go your way and tell John. I'm sorry, this is about John. You remember when John had some difficulty? Poor John, he was thrown into prison. And when you are in prison, for truth's sake, uh, you sometimes wonder why, Lord, why did you allow that? I don't know if any one of you were in prison. Were any of you in prison for truth's sake for a while? In prison, in jail. Oh, there's a brother there. Yes, yeah, brother, brother there too. Well, the Lord also allowed me to spend about eight months. And you wonder why you are there. Why? Why? Particularly when they come and uh, um, put you, you know, then you know there is a, a saying that people put you at ease, and there's a saying that people put you at, what's the opposite to ease? <laughs> this ease, is it? Difficulty. They t- trouble you very much. Yes, trouble. They did it for me for a while. And you wonder why, Lord. You know, sometimes we do not understand why John questioned whether Jesus is the one or shall we wait for another. But if we were in John's place, perhaps we would do the same. Not perhaps we would do the same. But... And I can tell you from experience. And of course, the prison in John was, in which John was, I don't think it was the same prison as the United States or in Australia. I'm not sure what kind of prisons are here, but I know in Australia, because I had to do, I, by trade, I'm a tailor, and I had to do tailoring for prison officers. And they showed me the prisons and the cells. They were like hotels, hotel rooms, probably three stars, not five, but still very good. But prison in John, in which John was, I tell you, that was not a, that was not a hotel room. And so he sent his disciples and Christ asked Jesus, "Are you the one?" What did Jesus say, brethren? And Jesus didn't. Jesus didn't say, "I am the one." God just tell John, "I am the one," and that's it. What did he say? Go and tell. Go and tell. Exactly. What to tell to John? Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. What ye have seen and heard. And what did they see? How did the blind see? The blind see. Brothers and sisters, we have to do the works of Jesus today, don't we? So through our work, the blind have to see. So let's, let's, let's say it's at least first spiritually blind to see the truth, isn't it? To see the message. This is the idea to fulfill the, the, the work of Christ. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. All this can be also in spiritual, spiritual, spiritually uh, applied as well. The dead are raised, the, to, the poor, to the poor the gospel is preached. Then we have this noble man whose uh, son was healed and so on and so forth. Now Christ also uh, healed deaf, mute people. Um, he, the ears, he put his fingers into his ears and, and his pet and touched his tongue, and so he was healed. Now Christ, in John 15:15, 15, 15, he decided to hook all his servants or his disciples of his friends or his people to call him them how to call them friends you are my friends Jesus said John 15 15 henceforth I call you not servants for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth but I have called you friends 
For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So Jesus decided to call his disciples friends. And all the people that followed him were his friends. Now, what happened with his friends? The friends you know, whom Christ loved so much. People whom he healed, whom he helped. Well, let's read Isaiah 53. What we read in the beginning. From starting from verse 3, let's go to right to verse 7. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with griefs. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Brothers and sisters, this is for, for us. He went through this. For you and for me. Christ went through this. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. <clears throat> We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of whom? Of us all. You know, Peter said, you know, we might think now, but we would not act that way. We would not cry out, crucify him, crucify him. I don't think Peter cried out, crucify him. But what did Peter do? Nothing. Nothing. Well, not exactly nothing. Yeah, he did not defend him, true. Well, he tried to defend him, yes. But Peter, what did he say? I don't know him. I do not know this man. And when they tried to prove that uh, he was his follower, what did he start to do? Cursing even. Denying. So totally denying. A man who said to Jesus, If all forsake thee, I will never do this, Lord. I will follow you where? Till death. Till death. If I have to die for you, I will die. Well, eventually he did, but not at that stage. He was not prepared to do that. But yes, we have to ask ourselves. 722,000 years ago and 720 today, we are today, 2005. Would we do the same? Or are we different? We have to ask ourselves that question, my brothers and sisters, individually, before the Lord, in our hearts. We have to ask ourselves, how would we act? Would we deny Jesus like Peter? Or would we even cry, crucify him? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone off to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is done. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken into, from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. That's exactly what Pilate declared. So, Isaiah, through inspiration, declares. He suffered and died alone. And Desire of Ages, page 746, says, He alone, alone he suffered abuse, abuse and mockery from wicked men. Where, were the, where was this multitude that followed him when he did these great and wonderful miracles? Where were they? That's it for the, the, the word of God in Spirit of Prophecy tells us. The disciples feared for their own lives. And they all forsook him and fled. They feared for their own lives. When he was arrested, when he was before the pilot, when he was being led to be crucified, they feared. What did they do? 
They wanted to preserve their physical, temporal lives, which do not last long anyway, but very short. His life is very short. But they uh, valued more temporal, their temporal lives than eternity. Can you see? The followers of Jesus, his friends, did that. The disciples feared for their own lives, and they all forsook him and fled. Jesus was left alone in the hands of the murderous mob. Murderous mob? Romans? No, again, his people, isn't it? Of the multitude, now this is important to notice this, of the multitude that followed the Savior to Calvary, Many had attended him with joyful hosannas and the waving of palm branches as he rode triumphantly to Jerusalem. But not a few who had then shouted his praise because it was popular to do so now swelled the cry of crucify him, crucify him. I read again, my brothers and sisters. Of the multitude that followed the Savior to Calvary, many had attended him with joyful sanas and waving of, the palm, of palm branches as he rode triumphantly to Jerusalem. But not a few, in other words, many of those who cried Hosanna and welcomed him with palm branches. What did they do now? Crucify. They called, yeah, called out, crucify him, crucify him. It was popular then to, to shout his praise, but now they swelled the cry of crucify him, crucify him. When Christ rode into Jerusalem, the hopes of the disciples had been raised to the highest pitch. They had pressed close about their master. Feeling that it was a high honor to be connected with him. That was a different situation. You see, brothers and sisters, we have to consider our lives ourselves also. We have to question, are we in faith? Are we really believers uh, under all circumstances and at all times? Are we followers of Christ, truly followers of Christ? We might never come to this situation because Jesus did not die again. He died once. He, he gave the supreme sacrifice. But we crucify him. Each time we commit what? Each time we sin, we crucify Jesus again. Each time we commit a sin, what do we cry? Crucify him, crucify him. Because this is what sin does. When Christ rode into Jerusalem, the hopes of disciples had been raised to the highest pitch. They had pressed close about their master, feeling that it was a high honor to be connected with him. Now, in his humiliation, they followed him how close? At a distance. They, they followed him at a distance. They were filled with grief and bowed down with disappointment, hope, disappointed hopes. How were the words of Jesus verified? All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite this shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. <coughs> and so I just wish to read a few more thoughts. He suffered without the camp. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us, Youth instructed June 28, 1900, as Adam and Eve were banished from Eden for transgressing the law of God, so Christ was to suffer without the boundaries of the holy place. He died outside the camp where felons and murderers were executed. There he trod the winepress alone, bearing the penalty that should have fallen on the sinner. So he bore our penalties, my brothers and sisters. Jesus came, comes to us many times. I just wish to say Christ came again. Not bodily, physically, in 1888. How was he treated then? Well, very much the same. 
very much the same by God's people he was treated. There were few, of course, when he was being laid to the cross who were true followers of Christ, only small remnant. And so going over the history, coming to 1888, majorities tried to crucify him. Only few accepted him, brothers and sisters. And we can go, we could go from year to year, even 1914, 18, the majority said crucify him or crucified him. Only few accepted him. Now today, how are we standing today, my brothers and sisters? We have to know ourselves. We have to examine ourselves. Where are we today? Are we with the Lord? Are we? going to follow him at a distance when difficulties come or are we to be close to Jesus when temptations come so this is something that we ourselves should have to, to, to ask the Lord we ourselves to ask, uh, ask the Lord to give us strength to be truly his people not to be reformers just by name for better not to have this name if we are not reformers brothers and sisters it is better not to have this name. I think it was, who was it, Alexander the Great? Was it Alexander the Great who said to this man, uh, what's your name, who was fearful, is it? Was fearful change in the... Your change your name or change your character. That's it. I, I just said it instantly, yes. Yes, because uh, no soldier of Alexander the Great could be fearful he had to be courageous like, like Alexander himself. So we have to be truly followers of Christ. And we are to, by the grace of the Lord, have the glory of Jesus. And that is his character. And this is what the Lord wants us, my brothers and sisters, in these last days. If we could study, as Brother Silva brought out, this is only a small portion of the plan of salvation. Studying the whole plan of salvation is a, a, a great, wonderful study. And we need to look into it daily, every day of our lives. And we are to be connected with Christ, as we said in the lesson, as, as the branch to the wine. We have to be con continuously with Jesus every moment of our lives. Otherwise, we shall do the same what those people did, perhaps not crying out, in our words, crucify him, but how? How can we cry out, crucify him? By our actions, exactly. By our deeds, by our very lives, but with our thoughts. And we can crucify Jesus by contact with our friends, how we de how deal with each other, how we deal with each other, how we, uh, our whole deportment, our whole life can testify whether we are with Christ or whether we are at a distance following him and when the difficulties come we shall say no we don't know him I don't know who he is so I pray to the Lord that our experience will be one um, to be true friends of Christ at the closing I wish to read this statement how the Lord send comforter you know what Jesus said to disciples he will send a comforter so today Holy Spirit is working in our hearts it says, there is no comforter like Christ. So tender and so true. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. His spirit speaks to the heart. Circumstances might separate us our friend, from our friends. The broad, restless ocean might roll between us and them. Though their sincere friendship might still exist, they may be unable to demonstrate it. But no circumstance, says, no distance can separate us, separate us from heavenly comforter. Nothing can separate us from Jesus unless we ourselves decide to do so. Wherever we are, wherever we might go, He is always there. He is always there. Many times people ask me questions, and some of the brethren also, the others who travel a lot. And the Lord gave me also this uh, opportunity to travel quite a lot. Many times people ask me, 
Aren't you afraid, Brother Jackson, when you go in that plane that it might crash? This question has been asked many times. Have you been asked? People ask this question. But I said, no, once I'm, I am in, in the plane, and the dead door locks, and the plane takes off, goes in the air, and I become fearful. I cannot tell the, the, the uh, cabin crew, look, I'm so fearful I want to get off. <laughs> I cannot tell them that. But what I can do, what can I do? I can pray, I can talk to Jesus, because He is there. Christ is there. Wherever we are, wherever we might go, He is always there. And if we are with Him, my brothers and sisters, we are safe in His arms. I don't, know, I don't particularly think of this physical, temporal body. We are safe for eternity. This is important. So always at our right hand. He is there. One given in Christ's place to act in His stead. He is always at our right hand to speak soothing, gentle words, to support, sustain, uphold, and cheer. The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. This Spirit works in and through everyone who receives Christ. Those who know the indwelling of this Spirit reveal reveal its fruit. What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, this we shall possess and manifest in our lives. We will show to all the people because the Lord died for all. For everyone, Jesus has died. And the Lord wants to save all. So may the Lord help us that this wonderful glory, this wonderful character of Jesus will be ours. And then uh, Isaiah 60, was it Isaiah 61, is it? Will be fulfilled. And I like to always to read these texts. Arise and shine. What does it say there? Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2, it says, Arise and shine for the... And uh, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. If the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, never ever shall we cry in our deeds, in our thoughts, in our actions, crucify him, crucify him. Never, my brothers and sisters. We shall be close to Jesus. We shall not follow him at a distance, but we shall close to him. For only then is our safety sure. May the Lord help us, brothers and, brothers and sisters, that this will be fulfilled in our lives, particularly in these last days, um, when many people are denying Christ while they profess to follow Him. They are denying Him in, his, in their lives. May we follow Christ not only in our words, but in our very lives, to be truly friends.